the next oration is about Dr. V. Raju's oration. The speaker is at another Stanley and has come down from USA. Very happy that he has been attending an international conference organized by Apollo Hospitals. He's been kind enough when I requested him, can you give a talk for a brief time? I request Dr. Sundar Murliya to take his chair, please. Once again, thank you, Dr. Sundar, to kindly come and uh, give the oration. I request Dr. Ashna Murthy to garland Dr. Sundar.
went over to the UK, got his MRCP, and crossed the Atlantic, went to the US, and got his uh, board certification in air technology. He has authored 194 papers, some of which the New England Journal of Medicine and in the Lancet, and he has also got 40 book chapters and invited reviews. Sundar is a very well respected clinical researcher, and uh, uh, much sought, sought after speaker. We call him the Oregon Stroom Old Man. <laughs> and above all, he is a man of Great personal integrity. Over to you, Sundar. 80 minutes are yours, not one minute more. You already took three minutes away. That's my time. I don't know who you were describing. Nala Bayal is a Nala Bircha. You read outside North America, 
And in 25 of these 33, the management, you know, relied heavily on pre-existing, and most of it was the ADA guideline. 55% said, just out of interest, how many people follow any guideline? <laughs> Okay. Which guidelines do you follow? I'm just asking out of curiosity. Is there a guideline to treat diabetes? We all treat patients with diabetes. How do we know which drug to use? I mean, most of us depend on the sales rep who comes and says, sir, it's not best to That's the reality of the matter. But 36% use the idea of guidelines, 12% use the ACE guidelines. And uh, ACE guidelines was 9%. And most people follow the American Diabetes Association guidelines, and every year they put out in the January issue, they say standards of medical care. And what they say is the goal should be an A1C about 7%. You make it more stringent depending on various factors, less stringent depending on the patient, the disease, you know, disease duration, all these kind of things. It's a little complicated. But then they said these are not modifiable. You can't do anything about life expectancy, comorbidities, if you've got heart disease or not, or what. What you can modify is, and this is the two most important factors, is patient attitude and expected treatment effort and resources and support system. We can all write the best treatment if the patient cannot afford it. It's no use, that treatment. Many patients don't even believe they have a disease. In fact, they did a survey in the United States, and this has been published. They took lay people and they said, these are two kinds of people. One person's A1C is 9, his sugars are running 200, 250. It's not on any medication. Another person's A1C is 7. He's on three medications and insulin. Who is more sick? Everybody said the guy who's got A1C of 7. Why? Because he's taking pains and trouble to control his sugar. The guy who's 9 and 9, he's okay. So we have a lot of misconceptions that we need to get to. So the guidelines of the American Diabetes Association, in very small print, they say healthy eating, white control, and all that. Very few people. This is font like six or something. So then they say metformin. Lots of reasons for metformin. If you cannot tolerate metformin, they say, okay, use any of these five. Depending on, you know, efficacy, hypo, weight, and cost. So sulfonylurea, uh, TCDs, TDP4, anything, basically, you can use. Then they say, you know, A1C is more than 9, start with combination treatment. Then if that doesn't work, go to triple, mix and match what you want. And finally, you've got to come to insulin. The one big change is, or oh, if people initially, you find if they're catabolic, blood glucose sugars are running in the 300s, A1C is 10, then you might want to start with insulin to begin with. And ultimately, of course, you come to insulin. And this was a major change they made two years ago. Before they, sorry. Uh, they said basal insulin and meal time. Then they added GLP-1 agonist. And I think they might add SGLT-2 inhibitors. I think. I, I don't know. They'll again meet somewhere and fight and try to get a diagram. <laughs> then they said, importantly, if you want to avoid hypoglycemia, then they took out sulfonylurea is gone, insulin is gone. You've got the others over there. And, you know, I've given talks in many places. I asked people, how many have you experienced hypoglycemia? do raise their hands. Money, don't raise your hands. <laughs> okay. So actually when I did my fellowship training program in San Diego, uh, we all, we had to sign a consent form, then we sat around a big table, we had all kinds of food, glucagon, everything, and uh, we gave ourselves insulin. I gave myself 10 units of uh, fast acting insulin. My blood sugar was 88, 89, and then we checked. This is very painful. To check your sugar is painful. The injection is not painful at all. My sugar went down to 43. And I remember three distinct things that happened to me. First is I was sweating. And room was well like a vision of I was sweating. Second thing, I, uh, which I learned, my heart rate was about 140. I was afraid I had gone by AFib or something. My third thing, and the most important is, I felt hungry. I was so hungry, I don't like donuts. I ate three donuts that day. Then what happened is my sugar, I impaired glucose, my blood sugar went to 200, and the rest of the day I felt awful, awful. So hypoglycemia is not a good thing to experience. If your patient experiences one episode of hypoglycemia at night, it's scary. It's very scary if you get uh, uh, low blood sugar. So I'm not saying I don't use insulin. I do. But you have to be careful in older patients over there. Then they said, if you
you want, want to avoid weight gain? I, I don't know anybody who doesn't want to avoid uh, weight gain. Most, they don't want to gain weight. Then what they did is, they took away the thiazolidine diol, softenyl urea, and insulin. Now you're left with metformin plus either a DPP4, SGLT2, or GLP1. Then they didn't stop at that. Then they said, if cost is an issue, bring them back. The ones which cause hypoglycemia and weight gain, you've got to put them back. So you have to balance this out, and there is no real right or wrong answer over here. Importantly, I want to say is that 2017, they made some changes, and I just want to point it out. The first thing is we knew for a long time metformin causes P12 deficiency. And they said, if you have patients, look at the wording of this, okay? To reflect new evidence suggesting an association, not a causation, between B12 and long-term metformin use. They didn't say how long it was. Five years, seven years, ten years, I don't know. They just said long term. Consider periodic. What is periodic? Every six months? I don't. See, this is the way you have to put the wording in. And you have to use your clinical judgment. And supplementation as needed. How much they don't tell you? As needed. By whom? The doctor, the patient? I'm just saying. These are the way the guidelines and all are written. Then they said, of course, as you all know, empagliflozin or uh, uh, liraglutide for cardiovascular safety. And uh, you know that. And then, of course, for the first time, they said you can use uh, basal insulin plus GLP-1, or you can use premix insulin. They, they did not really support premix insulin. Do many people here use premix insulin? Yes. I do use it a lot. Yeah. So I do use it. It's convenient. But the problem with the premix insulin is the patient has to eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Most diabetics they have it because they eat all these. Meals a day. But if your patient takes the premix in the morning and forgets lunch or skips lunch, that patient is in trouble because the NPH over there is peaking and looking for food which is not over there. Okay. And then for the first time, the American Diabetes Association said, due to concerns about the affordability, new tables, they now give you the cost. They never gave that before. There's a huge battle. They actually put the median costs of the drugs over there, never done before. So where have you seen a guideline that gives you the cost and tells you this is what it costs? Anyway, ACE is another organization, and what they do is, their goal is now 6.5 and, I don't know where they got the number from, honestly, I don't know. 7% which the ADA has comes from the UK PDS, because as you come down, the complications come down. If you push it more, then you start, you, you, it's a U-shaped curve like with most uh, physiological processes that we have. Okay, now look at their road map. They call it the road map. You, you, I don't know that anybody would want to drive on a road like this. But they say if the A1C is less than 7, more than 7, more than 9, you know, metformin, and you can use it. And then remember what they put in very, very small print. Order of medications represents a suggested hierarchy of you, and the length of the line reflects the strength of the recommendation. And they fought long and hard. Can you figure out the difference between this line and this line and this line and this line? this kind of stuff. This is supposed to be 100%, this is supposed to be 75, this is 70. They fight over the length of the line. Believe me, it's there. Then, sorry, yeah. Then of course we have the IDF, Global Guidelines. But they haven't updated it. So they are, so everybody gives you, you know, metformin, then you can either consider sulfonylurea or for glucosidase, secondary sulfonylurea, metformin. I mean, you can take your pick and do what you like. You're not going to be wrong, you're not going to be right. It's what your patient can afford and less side effects with more effects. Then, of course, you come to insulin. And, of course, just recently, you know, this was in uh, to the end of 2016, there's this Indian Diabetes Management Algorithm group. They suggested an algorithm. What did they say? Well, again, it's complicated. So, I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't know. It's pretty complicated. So if you look over here, all these stratifications, first line, second line, third line, it's quite, it's not easy to figure out what to do. And I'll give you at the end my own personal observation. Okay. So why do we find it so difficult to treat our patients? First of all, there is the disease process. You know? Type 2 diabetes is, as it goes, beta cell function declines. You cannot do much about that at all. Then there is a treatment problem because we all delay in the intensifying treatment. We have, you know, in the US we have these charts, you know, come after three months, come after three months, patient product, doc, I, I know what to do, I won't eat this, I know what food to eat, I don't know, but nothing really happens. 
And this was what happened is this is the clinical inertia. So this, this is in the large database like the Kaiser database. They found that, you know, from the time people are diagnosed, around seven and a half, diet and exercise, by the time they start metformin or sulfonyl, you reach 8.6. Then, by the time they start the next drug, it's 9. And then by the time insulin is started, it's 9.6. And they said, our insulin initiation, the average patient spent five years with an A1C more than eight and 10 years with an A1C more than eight. We all do that, clinical inertia. I don't have time, I only got 10 minutes. Why in I am, you know, the clinical initials, we really don't treat to target, we treat to failure. We add the first drug, wait for it to fail, then we add the second drug, we don't treat to success. So people are advocating more combination therapy. I think the goal, this is a friend of mine, he died actually in Germany. He said the goal is to hit hard, hit early, but hit safely. Means treat them aggressively right at the beginning, but safely without advertising or weight gain. Anyway, the other thing is patient related. Patients don't want weight gain. Somebody wants weight gain, they fear hypoglycemia and adherence to treatment. How do we know whether the patient is taking the drug or not? In the US at least they have a database and usually they're found. 50 to 60 percent of the prescriptions are filled. The rest of the people don't even go to the pharmacy to buy it. And of those who fill it, at one year, about half of them are not taking it anymore. That's the data. And of course cost is a big issue. I had to struggle hard to get this OP sign. And I think it was a guy from IIT Bombay, Damodaran or somebody from Salem who, who got the award for this. Anyway, so what is, I've shown you all these guidelines, I've shown you all the barriers, but I haven't given you any suggestions. What do we do? Well, I think metformin is first line no matter what. If you can tolerate it, if you don't have real dysfunction and EGFR, which is less than 60, metformin by far away is the best uh, drug to take. But after metformin, what are you going to do and when are you going to do it? I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. So we actually in the United States about four years ago we started this study. It's called the Great Study, Glycemia Reduction Approaches uh, uh, Comparative <coughs> Effectiveness Study. How many more minutes I have? Seven minutes. Seven minutes. I will finish. So what we said, did do is we screen the people with type 2 diabetes, treated with metformin alone. A1C has to be more than 6.8 as a screening, less than 5 years duration, but we changed this, we made it 10 years duration of diabetes. So people with type 2 diabetes on max metformin and A1C, that we treat, bring them up to the max dose, and at the time we randomize them, they have to be between 6.8 and 8.5. So people with type 2 diabetes, less than 10 years of disease. We, we don't want people who need insulin straight off at the time. And then we randomized them, 5,000 subjects. We're using sulfonylurea. They've been around for more than 70 years. And actually yesterday there was a talk at the International Symposium. Sulfonylureas were discovered very serendipitously. There was this French man during World War II. He, you know, those days they used sulfonylamide and all the sulfur drugs. And he had another uh, antibacterial. And he found these patients were getting convulsions and their sugars were low. And they found out that sulfonamides can be used to lower blood glucose. So that's what we are going to be using clomiphenol of 8 milligrams a day. Then we use a DPP-4 inhibitor. In this case, that was the one which was available. Then we use a GLP-1 analog, beta-glutide, and then we use insulin straight off over there. So we follow these patients to see when does the second drug fail. Meaning, when does the A1C cross A? They're not going to get cardiovascular outcomes. You will look for that quality of life, kidney, uh, and everything. They're going to be looking at it. But basically, we want to know, sulfonylurea costs uh, less than one cent a day. Lipoglutide in the United States costs about $400 a month. It's very expensive. Insulin is everywhere from $100 to $200. The is also $300 to $400 a month. Now, maybe lipoglutide is really good. It's worth paying $400. We don't know that. This one, which doesn't even cost a dollar, might be as good as it. We don't know. We really don't have any good uh, studies over there. So I think when you go through the guidelines, this is what I felt like. You know, you wonder what is happening. At the end of it, I'm not any the wiser. So whatever you're doing, I think is good. And I know our previous speaker finished with uh, Thiru, uh, the Thirukural. Let me try my Tamil. You know, the money makes money in front of my Tamil. Anyway. Noi nadi, noi mudal nadi, adetani kum vai nadi, vai pachir. Correct?
Thank you. It loosely translates as diagnose the disease. But we won't diagnose the disease. We know how to diagnose diabetes. Trace its cause, overeating, lack of exercise. Seek the proper remedy. We don't know. So we have to seek it and apply it with skill. I think we have to do that. Thank you all very much for this.
Human beings are human beings. Blood glucose will affect your retina the same as it affects somebody in South Africa or in Australia. There are differences in other things, but I do not, you know, you can put a tweet out and then it, it gets carried by 100 people. Uh, uh, and uh, take a minute of uh, money. Yes, Association of Citizens of India, APCON 2017, gave a very clear guideline to the postgraduates and physicians and the conference. Very clear cut guidelines given by APCON for the practical physicians to go about. Please follow it. All the other things you hear and do whatever you want. Please follow it. No, no, I, I fully agree with you. I'm not disagreeing with you at all. I'm not disagreeing with you at all. It is absolutely bad for me. We have glimepiride in there. I've told, I use it a lot. Glycoside also. Glimepiride, glycoside. We, 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 more because glycoside is a twice a day drug usually because of its half life. So we use glimepiride. I use it a lot. I'm not saying no. That's why I said the question is, is the drug that is more expensive really good? We don't know that. And exactly in the US it's money that sells. But for the first time this is an NIH study trying to prove is it really cost effective. It may be good, but the cost may be too high. So the, the study we are doing is called the yeah, effectiveness, cost effectiveness. Yeah. I hope I didn't give anybody the false impression. That's what I'm saying. You have to treat based on the patient and on, the, on your thing. Do I use substance abuse? Absolutely. So I, I hope I, I apologize if I've given anybody a wrong impression at all. That is not my uh, intention. Thank you, Dr. Sundar. May I request Dr. Banu to hand over the certificate. Once again, take thank Dr. Sundar Amish is busy scheduled to accept our invitation and give a wonderful Thank you. Srinivas wants to hand over a book.